welcome to the channel. Okay, we're gonna get started today on a nice little series of pieces, a group of seven as a matter of fact, we're gonna group together and call the Seven Days of Pumpkin Heads. And this is gonna be part one where we meet Merv. Now, just a little bit of background here as we get started. Um, I have a large backlog of Halloween paintings that I've done throughout the month of October that I didn't really get a chance to publish as we went through October itself. So as we're getting into November here, I'm gonna be publishing these kind of as a group just to get them out of my backlog and move on to some other paintings. Uh, this one, as I mentioned before, is the first in a series of seven that are all focused on pumpkin heads. And uh, we're gonna give this one a name, we're gonna call it Merv Pumpkinhead. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, and seen some of the paintings that I did last year around the Halloween time frame, you may be familiar with Merv. I've introduced him before, I've drawn him before, um, and I'm using him again uh, for this year. Now, Merv Pumpkinhead is a character that's not my own. It's actually a character from a comic book I really enjoyed uh, reading when I was growing up uh, called The Sandman, written by Neil Gaiman. So I, I just want to give the proper credit there, but I did somewhat borrow this character for my own purposes. Now, the reason I have a whole series of these is based off a little uh, work project that I completed recently. Uh, the work project was basically doing a little, f something of a group activity where I developed a Jeopardy game in a PowerPoint presentation uh, that was Halloween themed. And at the end of the month, just before Halloween, the group all kind of gathered together and we played this Jeopardy game. And as part of the game, I did some artwork, uh, mostly surrounding the idea of using Merv Pumpkinhead as something of a game show host. And so this first painting is really kind of where we see how that's gonna kind of work here. Um, in the PowerPoint presentation that this ends up becoming, there is a game board that has kind of that Jeopardy setup, you know, with the point values and the categories. And this drawing here is gonna sit in front of the game board, acting almost as if the host is pointing out, you know, the next question that should be asked. So again, Merv is our host, and we'll see him in a couple of different other paintings as we go through the rest of this week. The intent here is I'm gonna publish again, seven days of pumpkin heads, seven different pumpkin head paintings over this week. Now, a little bit about the composition here. I had a general idea of what I wanted to do with this painting. I knew that the background wasn't gonna be important because he was ultimately gonna be pasted into an already existing PowerPoint slide. So all I really needed in the composition was the body and the podium that he's standing at. Anything in the back really doesn't matter. It's just gonna be uh, removed later anyway. As far as the rest of the composition is concerned, I really kind of played around with this and never really committed to anything until I got to my final ink work. So I knew that there was gonna be a podium. I knew that there was gonna be a body standing behind it. And I knew that body was gonna have a pumpkin head and that's about as far as I got. So in my loose sketches, I knew the podium was gonna go in pretty easily. It was just a basic rectangle uh, or, or a cubed rectangle, so to speak. So I got that drawn in a perspective pretty quickly with some straight lines. And then I composed the rest of it as I went along. So I started with the pumpkin and once I was happy with it, I inked it and then went back and fold around with the body until I decided in what position I really want this body to take. And you know, the reason I'm able to do this is because I'm working in this digital format. If this pumpkin was the wrong size or needed to be re-angled or, or twisted in some sort of way, shape and form, I can do that later once I get the body sketched in. Luckily for me, I've been doing this, I guess, long enough or drawing enough pumpkin heads that it all kind of worked out, but there was some resizing that needed to be done between the body and the podium, and you'll see that kind of come later. Right now, it's just a matter of me trying to decide what position I want this body in, more, more specifically the hands and the arms. Um, I did have an idea that one hand was gonna be holding some sort of cards that might have like his announcer notes on them, but the other hand was something I was very decided on, or undecided on, and you can see some evidence of that right now. I'm kind of sketching out some ideas of where I want this hand to sit. Did I want it kind of pointing towards the board or did I want it grasping the edge of the podium? And really what this gets down to is um, deciding on a hand position that I feel comfortable drawing and making sure that drawing is to my satisfaction. I always struggle with hands. They're really difficult things to wrap your head around. They they, they can occupy a, different, a whole series of positions and the, the fingers can go in all sorts of wonky ways. And if you draw a line in a slightly wrong fashion, it can make that hand look unnatural. So I struggle with it, but it's also something I refuse to give up on. I keep at it and keep redrawing it until I'm relatively satisfied uh, with the way that it looks on the page. One of the tricks I've kind of figured out in doing this is well, actually, it's two things. Number one, draw the hand too big, and then you can shrink it down if you need to. 
But the other thing is to stop thinking of fingers as sausages. Um, it's something um, I, I learned a long time ago when I was first learning to kind of draw. Uh, I started drawing cartoon hands, you know, with the three fingers, you know, a la Simpsons and Disney and stuff like that. And I was always kind of told that, you know, if you think of the fingers as these big round sausages, that's the way to go about it. And that certainly makes sense when you're drawing cartoonish type hands. But when you get into these four fingered hands with a thumb and you're trying to make them look a little bit more natural, I think it might be more helpful to think of fingers more as rectangular cubes that, that have six planes or six surfaces to them. Um, and in that way, you can have this understanding that your shadows will kind of line along one side of that plane and then light can line up along another side of that plane, almost like it would if it was some sort of a cube. Again, it makes sense to me if this is something that you have some questions about, you know, leave something in the comments section. I might do a video a little bit later on just on hands, or at least what I've learned in trying to render hands over some time. Now, one of the other things that I also did is I took the face of the pumpkin head and I decided to, to kind of compose that a little bit later in the uh, drawing as well. Uh, usually when I go through my process, I make sure I have a really, really tight, for lack of a better term, pencil sketch before I move into my inks, my final line work. But this is something I wanted to approach a little bit looser. I wanted to have some fun with this, make some decisions on the fly. So. Uh, what I was able to do here was just draw the pumpkin in, have an idea of where that basic line work existed. And then on a different layer, fool around with the face, decide what sort of an expression I wanted to put onto it. And that's what I'm kind of struggling through right now. Not that it was much of a struggle, it was really more just a, a series of experimentations to decide exactly what expression I wanted on his face. And this is something I'm doing with pretty much all the pumpkin head pieces, is kind of coming to this idea that I have a lot of freedom when it comes to the expression on the face because that carving, so to speak, in the jack-o'-lantern can take any form that I want it to be. And that means I can exaggerate things in terms of expression as well. So this is a great example of it. With this particular jack-o'-lantern, I made the decision to go with this really toothy, you know, over-the-top game show host type grin. And I was really able to kind of stretch that grin out so it went from one end of that pumpkin to the other, something that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do with, with the, uh, the basic anatomy of a human face. So again, it was really kind of nice to kind of step outside the shell here and do something a little bit different, considering I, I usually draw a lot of human faces. So now that I'm kind of satisfied with the line work here, I'm going to go in and do a little bit of touch up. I wanted to get a little good detail in here, and I also wanted to pay a little bit of attention to my line weight. Um, basic stuff here, just making sure my shadows are thicker lines and things like that. And now we can move into the color phase. And what you may have noticed right off the bat here is there was a shift here in the background to a darker gray. This is going to allow me to help balance my light and darks a little bit easier, and to have a, a more of a mid-tone mid gray to kind of compare everything to. And then I'm gonna go in to separate my colors uh, by layer. So I'm really kind of working in four layers throughout this entire piece. Uh, the top layer, so to speak, would be the podium. Then I have the body, torso, hands, and arms. That's all their own layer. The pumpkin itself is a third layer. And then on top of all that, the fourth layer would be the face in the jack-o'-lantern. And now that I've got my base colors in, my kind of mid-tones, if you will, it's time to start adding in lights and shadows. Now this is gonna go relatively quick, but it's really not much different than what I usually do in most of my uh, uh, digital artwork, uh, which is where I create a palette for my light and shadows and then kind of start painting them in. Uh, a little bit of shadow first and a little bit of the light, just trying to kind of create a balance along the way until I'm satisfied with the end result. With this piece, I note, you may notice here, I kind of painted in a little bit of the light already. It, it seems a little bit silly, but sometimes I find that it helps just to kind of create a couple of lines to show me what direction the light is coming from so I can be a little bit more consistent with my shadows and you know ultimate the lights as well. But mostly this helps inform the shadows. I, I tend to put those in first, and so I wanna make sure that they're consistent with wherever that light source is coming from. And in this case, the light source is really meant to be coming from the uh, game show board that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So again, he's going to be pasted into a PowerPoint slide a little bit later on. We, we won't see in this video, uh, but the PowerPoint slide that he's pasted on has a built-in kind of game board sitting there that, you know, emits a bluish light. The blue is kind of the theme color here. And that gets us into our palette. Um, when it comes to the lights and shadows here, even though I'm using a, a similar method that I always use, it's the color palette that's going to be a little bit different this time. So the color palette I'm using is in the bottom right hand corner of the screen in that black box. And you can see that the first two colors at the top there are gonna be my shadow colors. And these are really kind of unusual colors, ones that I don't usually use. These are warm shadows. The top color there is a reddish gray. It's, it's more gray than anything else, but it does have a red tint to it. And a light gray at that. Underneath that, we have a darker reddish gray. 
And I'm using those on a uh, blend mode in order to be able to uh, get the shadow colors in here. Again, these are warm shadows. We're gonna complement them by light lights, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, cool lights. And remember, these are blue lights mostly because of the fact that we're getting light emanating from this bluish game board that he's gonna be appearing on. Uh, I work in opposites like that. So if I'm using cool lights, warm shadows are gonna be my norm. There's not really much else to kind of say about that in, in the sense that it's really just a different color palette, but the method is still the same. So I'm putting in a layer of shadows using that kind of lighter grayish red. I want to balance it out with some of the lights on the other side. And then a little bit later, I want to add in the darker reddish shadow color. And I'm going to use that to kind of help emphasize some of the darks a little bit later on to help give it a little bit more depth. And the idea is I'm going to work back and forth. I'll put in some shadows, then some light, and back to the shadows, getting a little bit darker, then some more lights, getting a little bit lighter. And I'm going to go back and forth, attempting to achieve, again, that balance of, 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 of shadow and light. Now, what do I mean by balance? Well, it's, it's really just a look. And mostly, if you pay attention to the pumpkin head, you can really kind of see where I try to tweak this as much as possible. As I painted in the shadow, it got darker and darker. And as I painted in the light, it got lighter and lighter. What I'm looking for is something that appears to me to look as much physically like a pumpkin in three dimensions as I can manage. Something that tells me that, all, that, that those bumps, those striations have some depth to them. That the, uh, that the, that the uh, line work that's inside the interior of the pumpkin is actually there because it's going into a recessed shadow area that the light source that's coming from that game board is really kind of bouncing off certain areas of that pumpkin, like the stem on the top, for instance. Now again, we don't see that necessarily right now, but that's the goal that I'm working towards. And I try to remain consistent about that as much as possible. Once I'm relatively satisfied with how that pumpkin look works, then I'll move into the other layers and do a similar effect on the torso layer and then ultimately the podium layer last. Now, uh, one of the other things that I'm gonna get into a little bit later, and, and it'll happen pretty quick, which is why I'm gonna talk to it now, is the line work. Um, ah, here it is right here. I'm gonna start covering up the line work by basically going into the line layers and choosing to uh, uh, put it on a setting called auto lock so I can just color over the lines and nothing else and just change the color from black to something matches more uh, uh, of the color of the area that it's in. So for instance, again, that pumpkin head area, the line work is being changed to either a dark orange, kind of reminiscent of the shadow colors on one side and then more of a whitish blue color on the opposite side that's facing the light. This hides the line work, so to speak, but I'm not trying to hide it entirely. I, it is uh, meant to you know, get away from the bold black, but at least give us some sense that there is a, a, a defining line of dimension around the, the, the form and the figure itself. Um, you'll see something similar gonna happen on the podium in just a second as well. Those lines are really awfully thick, but because they're really thick, it's really kind of meant to give you this idea that there's some three dimensions, uh, some, um, some three dimension to the podium in the sense that there's some areas that kind of pop out. Now, uh, we put a little Merv name there and an H4. This is actually my fourth version of this Halloween game. And I I'll follow up on that a little bit more in future videos. So that finishes this one up. Uh, again, it was a pretty quick one, but we've got six more of these coming throughout the rest of the week. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And thanks for tuning in. Take care.